Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Inigo, and thanks, uh, Santiago, for inviting me to speak today to you and share some of our uh, findings and experience with uh, the away patient. So the... Is this working? Okay, so this is a conjoint effort of uh, the BCBL that is one of the excellent research centers here in the Basque Country and Osaki uh, and the University of the Basque Country. Uh, in particular, Hospital Cruces, where Inigo is based. Uh, I cannot pass the slides. <laughs> okay, I'll do it here, don't worry. It's not working either. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What's going on? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. So the outline for today is um, I'm going to describe a little bit the general assessment that uh, we do with the patients uh, before the surgery and uh, some of the tasks that we are doing, uh, not all, but just an example of the tasks and how we do this general assessment, to uh, move on to uh, some preliminary uh, findings, data, some preliminary analysis on functional connectivity with resting state, and then structural connectivity with DTI, and then a kind of uh, way to combine both, right? Because the, the ultimate goal was, as uh, Dr. Dufour said uh, previously, uh, it will be good to have some kind of tool that allow us to predict the recovery of uh, those patients. So uh, the uh, general idea is the, the patient arrives to the BCBL because uh, already Inigo and uh, Santiago told us that there is this patient that is uh, going to be uh, uh, in surgery, so uh, we do in the first day a T1, T2, uh, DTI and resting state and uh, some general assessment with the neuropsychologist and depending on the results of the first day, then we move on to the second day with uh, MRI again and, and, and an MEG with a specific task depending on where the tumor is and depending on how the evaluation of the patient was, right? Now, uh, here there is an example of the tasks. Uh, we live, as we saw in the previous talks, in a bilingual community. Most of the people, or a huge amount of people, are bilingual. And so we uh, want to take advantage of that because the two languages are very different typologically from a linguistic point of view, right? So uh, if uh, the patient is bilingual, we do in Spanish and in uh, uh, Basque. Of course, we use the... Uh, kind of the AT, this doesn't point, okay. So uh, the D, uh, AT and then we do uh, action naming because verbs is, uh, are more complex than just naming objects, so you need to access to another type of morphology. Uh, so you have this uh, access to semantics, to morphology, uh, and then depending again on how the tumor is uh, located and how is the a patient, uh, uh, I mean, for instance, whether it's bilingual or monolingual, in the case of bilinguals, we also use switching because switching gives you uh, not only the access to the two languages because you want to map the two languages, but also to the control, the executive control. So you need to control yourself and see if the square is red, for instance, you have to name it in, in, in Basque. If the square is uh, green, you have to name it in Spanish. And so you have to control and therefore you need to put uh, in motion uh, some uh, other circuits, uh, apart from just the access to the, to the language. Uh, another example is if, uh, for instance, the tumor is in the left fusiform or around the left fusiform, uh, we know that in most of the cases these uh, patients have problems with reading and with face recognition, so uh, we use, for instance, this reading aloud task with they have to read words, see the words, and consonant strings as a baseline, or faces against houses or words or not obvious. And so depending, again, how the patient uh, looks like, uh, we 
uh, use one task or the other or a combination of two. Now, one of the things we usually do is to combine, uh, to do not only fMRI, but to combine fMRI and uh, MEG because, as you know, most of the cognitive processes are done very fast. I mean, in 200 milliseconds, we do a lot of things. In 400 milliseconds, you can, uh, you know, output a, a, a naming that engage a lot of very many different processes because you have to access to the meaning, but you have to send signals to articulate at the end. And there are a lot of very many things that happen in, in, in between. So uh, uh, fMRI can capture some things, but for other things, it's better to uh, see what happens with the, with the, with the imaging, right? Uh, this is another task, and with this I, I finish. So this is in order to get into more detail uh, when you have to access to a word, you access not only to the word as a whole, but you access to the uh, particular type of uh, elements that are engaged in the word. So it's not the same to uh, uh, replace the two internal letters than to get the same letters in different positions. So we know from other research that when you read a word, you access to these elements of the word, and you have to do two things, to identify the element and the position of the element, right? Okay, so this is an overview of what uh, we usually do with uh, the different tasks. And uh, again, one uh, thing we combine is uh, the MRI, both structural and functional MRI, with uh, a with the uh, MEG. Uh, okay, so for those who are unfamiliar with MEG, MRI, uh, fMRI gives you a very good spatial resolution, uh, but as I said before, uh, it's quite uh, slow. I mean, this, the hemodynamic signal is quite slow for capturing the cognitive processes that are very fast. So uh, MEG gives us a good compromise between uh, temporal resolution and spatial resolution. Uh, so the spatial resolution is not as good as the fMRI, but it's quite good. And at the same time, it gives us a uh, temporal resolution of the millisecond, so we are able to capture very many different uh, uh, tiny manipulations with uh, this MEG. Okay, so after uh, this general introduction with uh, the different tasks, let's move on to functional analysis with resting state in the MEG, right? So uh, what we are gonna uh, see now is uh, what happens with alpha waves. I explain now why alpha waves in uh, peritumoral and contralateral regions of the tumor. And on top of that, we are gonna see uh, how these alpha waves behave before the surgery and two times after the surgery to see whether there is any change uh, in these alpha waves. And I'm, I'm explaining now why is this important. So what alpha waves are? So alpha waves are neural oscillations in the frequency range of 8 to 12 uh, hertz. And from other research, we know that there is evidence that these oscillations serve an important role in functions like uh, the communication between brain areas. So we are talking about connectivity between uh, different areas, right? For instance, here, when we compare just eyes open with uh, eyes closed, I cannot point here. OK, so you see. When, when we compare eyes open with eyes closed, you see here that with eyes open, there is a huge alpha wave. And uh, sorry, with eye closed, and when you open the eyes, the alpha waves uh, diminish in amplitude, right? Usually, for instance, if you do a motor task, uh, you see the alpha waves, the amplitude of the alpha waves at rest is uh, higher than when you do a, a song task, like, uh, for instance, this motor control task, right? So these alpha waves. Uh, diminish this uh, amplitude. Okay, so uh, if we combine this story with uh, what we know for alpha waves, whether they are clinical useful for detecting brain uh, anomalies, and that change these alpha waves when there is this tumor as compared to alpha waves from uh, healthy tissue, uh, and on the other hand, we know that there is uh, evidence 
uh, some other MEG studies, the disrupted brain, uh, uh, resting uh, uh, state, so the, the disrupted resting neural network, after a stroke is uh, normally accompanied with uh, increased activity in alpha frequency bands in these peritumoral areas. So there is independent evidence that alpha waves can be engaged in connectivity, in functional connectivity, and uh, also that could be a marker in peritumoral uh, tissue uh, as compared to uh, normal tissue, right? So uh, the predictions that we have uh, for the experiments, uh, for the results I'm going to present you today is uh, comparing alpha uh, waves in peritumoral brain regions during resting state before and after the surgery. Yeah? So there are three main questions that we try to address. One is we predict stronger alpha power in peritumoral brain areas than in contralateral uh, brain areas before surgery. So that could be an interesting marker for uh, the uh, tissue around the tumor. Uh, weaker alpha power in peritumoral areas after the surgery than before the surgery, right? And finally, increased connectivity between the peritumoral brain areas and the rest of the brain after the surgery, yeah? So according to the previous literature, we think that those could be the predictions, and then we'll see whether these predictions uh, are right or not, are backed up by the data. So uh, we still don't have these uh, 300, uh, 1 million patients that you have in other labs. We just started uh, not very long time ago. And so what I'm going to present is a very modest, eight patients. Uh, with tumors in different areas, right? But we are trying to get what is common between them. So, uh, very simple session with uh, five minutes eyes closed, resting state, in three sessions. Oh, here. So, one is uh, before surgery, and then three months later after the surgery, and uh, six months later after the, the, the surgery. And uh, to remind you, again, what we expect is changes in peritumoral regions after the brain surgery, and also differences in brain connectivity between uh, before and after surgery, right? So here are the eight patients. As you see, they are quite different, but what we delineate is the area, the peritumoral area, yeah, in these uh, different uh, patients. And uh, what we... Uh, uh, do is uh, get these peritumoral uh, regions with a mask uh, before the surgery and immediately after the surgery. So you map the different brains and uh, uh, so you have the same uh, tissue to be compared between the uh, pre-surgery, post-surgery one and post-surgery two. Yeah? Uh, we also uh, analyze the contralateral region, so we design another mask in the contralateral region of this, um, of this uh, tumor. Of course, uh, we took a little bit more tissue because it covers not only the peritumoral, but in this case, what will be the tumor region. And uh, we asked whether there was uh, any change in the power spectrum of the alpha waves before and after the surgery. And this is what we got. So this is the, uh, the, the amplitude of the power spectrum, and you see between 8 and 12 uh, hertz. And when you uh, uh, compare this difference, these tiny differences here, you will see here that there is the amplitude is larger in, uh, before surgery and diminishes uh, after surgery, after post-surgery uh, one and post-surgery uh, two, right? So we find changes in the uh, tumor uh, area uh, before and after surgery. And what happens with the uh, contralateral? So we check, and with the contralateral, is not uh, happening. Well, first of all, there is a difference between the power spectrum with the tumor as compared to the contralateral. If you check these two, right, the amplitude is not comparable uh, visually, but you can see how, you know, it's different, the, the, the solid line. So you check the solid line, 
Here you see that is larger in the case of the tumor than in the contralateral side. And the other thing is that there is this uh, diminishing of the amplitude in the case of the uh, tissue around the tumor, but no differences in the contralateral side. Yeah? Now, the other thing that we did was look at connectivity. Uh, and here what I'm going to present is two patients as an example. Uh, so what we did was uh, two things. One is to see what happens with the tissue around the, the, the tumor, the mass that I, I send you, and to see how this tissue is connected with the rest of the brain. And you see that these green regions are the ones that are connected above, above the threshold uh, between the peritumoral regions and the rest of the brain. And now what we took is because it was computational demanding, uh, we took only several seeds that are the ones that are in red, and we asked the question, are those regions connected differently before surgery, like in this case, and after surgery? So we are not comparing the whole green uh, uh, tissue. What we are comparing is just the red dots before and after surgery, right? And what you see is uh, that the main connectivity, well, this is a measure is uh, partial direct coherence. It's a measure of uh, uh, connectivity uh, in, the, in the connectivity community. So we see that there is an increase of connectivity between uh, uh, before surgery and after surgery. This is what happens with one patient, and this is what happens with uh, another patient. So in both cases, uh, we see uh, an increase of connectivity after surgery as compared to uh, pre-surgery. And on top of that, I mean, it seems that between three months and six months, the connectivity is also increased. Well, this is good, but you want to know more, right? I mean, you want to know what that means, and, uh, whether it's useful or it's not useful. And so one of the things you want to do is to correlate these connectivity changes with behavior, right? And uh, one of the things that we do uh, in the screening phase, but also when they come back for uh, after surgery, is uh, this neuropsychological battery of different tests, including some IQ, but also what we call the BEST, that stands for Basque Spanish, uh, no, Basque English Spanish uh, test, that is a bunch of very many different um, pictures, uh, non cognates between the different uh, languages, that give us a score of the proficiency in each of the languages, right? And so when you correlate this, uh, so it, what you do is to correlate the difference between the post and the pre, uh, and you correlate with the behavior differences between the post and the, and the pre, right? And here you see a significant correlation. This is each of the uh, individuals. We have to um, uh, uh, discard one because several reasons, but you see this uh, very nice correlation with the intelligence test performance between post and pre with the connectivity. So that means that this connectivity has some kind of impact on the behavior, both in the uh, general, well, the KBT is, uh, for those who are not familiar with, is an intelligence test, IQ test that measure verbal and nonverbal intelligence, and with the, with the best that this is a, a, a test of um, the proficiency in the different languages. And you see again a very interesting correlation. So it means that surgery has an impact on the connectivity, but also on the behavioral performance. And that there is some kind of relationship between this uh, connectivity and uh, behavioral performance. So let's look at another bit of information that is the structural connectivity. So far what we were considering was functional connectivity. Now uh, we know that there will be probably also changes in the structural connectivity. For those who are not familiar with, uh, we will use DTI, that is a diffusion tensor imaging, that is an MRI uh, technique. Uh, to capture the fiber tracks. So uh, it's a kind of 
for those who are not familiar, kind of mathematical recreation of the different tracts uh, in the brain, right? Using, uh, so, so, so it's a, we, we should keep in mind that this is not real, it's just a mathematical recreation, right? So uh, DTI has been found useful for pre-surgical planning in patients with brain tumors. Uh, before it was mentioned that the prognosis will be different whether the tumor was, for instance, in the IFOF, I mean, whether there was penetration in the IFOF or not. So uh, the DTI can help us also to uh, understand better the tumor and the prognosis of uh, the tumor. Uh, so the preservation and the normalization of the DTI uh, in these peritumoral regions after surgery is probably critical for the reorganization of brain function underlying this brain recovery. And so, again, what we are asking is whether there are changes in the DTI before and after surgery. Uh, again, are the same A patients with uh, this time they go to the DTI protocol and uh, what we expect is, uh, again, changes in the, the, the FA that is a measure of structural connectivity. I mean, there are very many, so this is one of, of, of them. And also what we want to understand is whether there is any kind of correlation between this functional connectivity that we saw before and the structural connectivity because somehow they should be, they should be related, right? So again, uh, what we, what we uh, did was to calculate the uh, fractional anisotropy in the, I mean, the difference between the uh, post-surgery and the pre-surgery, right? So to see whether there is any kind of gain that allow us to uh, go a little bit further at the end and predict the recovery, yeah? So this is an, ex uh, 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 an image of the overlap of the different tumors and with, with this overlap comparing the post and the pre, right? So uh, this red, this reddish, is the uh, white matter the between post and pre uh, is above threshold. And what we did is to correlate this uh, post versus pre difference in two measures, in the alpha power changes and in the FA changes. And uh, again, what you see is a remarkable correlation between functional connectivity and uh, structural connectivity. So we are seeing that there is a structural connectivity, functional connectivity, and behavior that are the three of them related. And it shows us also that after removing the tumor, these connectivities and the behavior improve, right? So not to bother you too much with this. Uh, with uh, the current data, what we can say is the alpha power decrease could reflect a connectivity improvement, the peritumoral brain areas, and the rest of the brain. Uh, these alpha power changes uh, probably are associated with the reorganization of white matter tracts. We still don't know, but it's uh, you know, very suggestive and preliminary evidence. Uh, because, I mean, getting these brain behavior cor uh, correspondences and the structural functional correspondences is not always obvious. And uh, I think it's an interesting avenue for pursuing this uh, line of research. Of course, this has been only done with uh, resting state. That is an interesting measure. But it could, we could go further and uh, use different tasks that we have the data already. Uh, to see whether the functional connectivity of these different tasks uh, correlates with the improvement in behavior and the improvement in the structural connectivity. And that will be for the next, for the next years. So I need to thank, because this is a conjoint effort of, uh, as I said at the beginning, from different uh, teams. So from the Hospital Cruces, we have uh, 
Santiago and Inigo, but we have also, I couldn't find the photo, so sorry about that. We have uh, people with the in the anesthesia and rehabilitation, so we have Ituri, we have Carmele, we have Leire and Maripaz. Here is the team in the BCBL that is in charge of the MRI, so Sandra is uh, in the audience. So this is the team that is in charge of um, the MEG. This is the neuropsychologist that is also in the audience, and the right that coordinates all this effort that is also in the audience. And of course, we need to thank not only these people, but also the different research agencies, because, uh, well, as we know, uh, it's very expensive to do fMRI, MEG experiments, so uh, thanks to EU and, uh, you know, the Spanish government, so, uh, and the Basque government, of course. Uh, I, 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 we are able to, to, to do this research. Um, for those who want to more information about us, so we are there in Facebook, Twitter, and all these uh, social networks, so we will be happy to, to you know, help and uh, try to answer any of these questions. And this is it. I am all right on time. Yeah. for your interesting talk and I would like to introduce the next test speaker that is Dr. Craig that will illustrate us about transcranial magnetic stimulation, brain plasticity and neuro